Okay. Here we go. Okay, <clears throat> it's actually on. minutes for people to stream in. If you got any questions or anything like that, feel free to hit up chat or just holler out. Give another minute or so, and then I'll get moving. I don't know how long this one is. Let me, how many slides I got in there? Eh, not too bad. It can get worse. Jokey. Uh, I'll just go ahead and get moving here. I'm sure people stream in uh, a little bit as we're going. <clears throat> uh, so we're shifting back today, um, sort of away from some of the nuts and bolts stuff back to some more applied stuff. And we'll do this kind of shift one more time. So today is going to get to some more, uh, I shouldn't say abstract, but some more sort of um, applied stuff that you'll commonly be doing with probably most data sets you'll work with. We're going to talk about importing data from uh, outside of R. So loading in from CSV files, R data files, STATA files, SPSS files, you know, whatever your data, your format, uh, it, whatever data format you're working with, <clears throat> how to export data into R's native formats, but also things like CSV files. Um, and then we're gonna spend most of today talking about um, doing certain data cleaning tasks that are common and important, like pivoting data is one of the big ones. And the more time you spend working in sort of the, the tidyverse world of things, the more important pivoting gets to be. Um, I basically am rarely doing any kind of operations on data that don't involve multiple pivotings of columns, because it's usually the best way to solve problems. Um, but we'll get there. We'll also talk a little bit about dates and times. So. The overall theme for today is sort of uh, data custodian work. Um, the idea is need to get our data in and out of R and make it analytically ready. That is clean it up so that we can do analyses with it. Most of us are doing some kind of either descriptive or statistical analyses with our data. So what we're gonna cover and talk about are things like working directories and projects. I talked a little bit about working directories and projects earlier in the term. We're gonna kind of review that just to make sure it sticks in your brain um, about dealing with files on your computer, knowing where things go, how to access them and how to build sort of uh, projects around it. Won't spend too much time on projects, but. I'm gonna talk about importing and exporting data specifically with the reader package and the Haven package. Reader is for sort of uh, files that are already a text format of some kind, like comma separated value or CSV files, TSV files, stuff like that. Haven is for pulling files, um, uh, for loading files that are in some sort of proprietary format of some commercial software, like SPSS, SAS, and things like that. Then we're going to talk about cleaning and reshaping data with TidyR. So cleaning and reshaping data, in particular reshaping data here, is about 
um, taking situations where you have um, data, like a column of data, what should be one variable spread over many, many columns and turn it into one or two columns, or when you have data uh, in one or two columns that should be many columns and spreading them back out. It turns out that's a really common thing and a very general thing, so you'll want to know how to do it. Then we're going to talk a little bit about dates and times with the Luberdate package. Only quite shallow uh, um, talk here. We're just going to talk a little bit about what date and time objects are to get you started. Um, but it's sort of a deep area and I don't really dwell on it in this class. If you spend a lot of time working with date time data, you'll kind of need to go out on your own and seek out some of the stuff. <clears throat> um, and then we're going to finish up talking about working with factor variables, talk about using um, different functions, especially in the forecats package to control the levels of your factors to make things like your plots and tables look nicer. Right? So we're kind of covering a hodgepodge of things that are all sort of generally around uh, getting your data in and in the format you want before you go and do something with it, like a plot or a statistical model. Okay. So first thing I want to talk about, I want to talk about directories on your computer and navigating them in R. So again, like I said, I think way back in uh, week two, um, the working directory is where R looks for and saves files by default. If you want to figure out what your working directory is at any time, you can type get WD. So when I knitted these slides earlier today, when I did get WD, the location on my computer where this RMD was and thus where its working directory was, is nested all the way in this long sequence of folders where I keep the week five lecture materials. Okay? That was the working directory for this RMD. If you use an RMD file, it's gonna use whatever folder it's in, in as the uh, working directory. Okay, so. Sometimes you're going to want to change that working directory. You can use set WD and then give it a path on your computer and it will change your working directory to that location. So if you're on a Windows style machine, or I guess it is just Windows machines, um, you might give it a path that looks like C colon slash something, something, something. If you're on a Mac, you give it a Mac style path or Unix style path, right? <clears throat> okay. Um, my suggestions for working directories if you're working with an RMD file, you really never should set a working directory in the first place. You should not be using working directories uh, manually if you're in an RMD file in general. A slightly more advanced version of using a working directory with an RMD is to use the here package, which I do not cover in this class, but that is a way that you can control like large project working directories in RMDs. I don't even use that. If I'm working on an RMD, I just have everything either in the folder or in some folder with a, a sort of static relationship to that one so I can reference it using um, yeah, what I'm going to talk about in a minute, which are uh, relative paths. So don't set working directories in a markdown doc. For larger projects, I also don't set working directories and advise people to not set working directories. Instead, use our Studio projects or the here package to manage working directories for you. You shouldn't be manually setting working directories. One of the problems with manually setting working directories is this path, whatever this is that you give on your computer, only exists on your computer and only on that particular one of your computers. So if you set a working directory, anytime you move it to another computer, you're going to have to change that working directory. That's really annoying. It's not good for reproduction. It's not even good for you if you work on multiple computers. I work across multiple computers. They have different paths everywhere. I don't want to have to deal with that. Yusuf, you got a hand up? Yeah, uh, just a random question. Sorry to, uh, it's a bit off topic, but it, when you're working in R markdown files and you have like a, a rather large document, like your, like for example, your dissertation, Chuck, mm -hmm. do you, you, is that all of that just in one uh, markdown file or do you have like multiples for different chapters? How do you? Many files, many, many it? files. Um, so, for like um, right now, I don't actually have any RMDs associated with my dissertation. Everything the right now the text is in its own files, and then the uh, the code is in syntax files. Um, what I'll do later is when I finally make an RMD out of it and do that, um, it's going to pull all of the results from the result, all the modeling, all that stuff will be done with syntax files. They'll dump their output to 
uh, individual R objects, and then all the R and D will do is call to those R objects, and then the dissertation will be broken up with a, a different R and D file for each chapter and subchapter. So, like the main three chapters of the dissertation will each be their own uh, R and D file, and then I have a couple appendices. Each one of the major ones is its own um, R and D file, and then they just get knit together uh, with one uniting document using Bookdown. Um, so Bookdown is the package. So if you've ever looked at like uh, uh, like the R for data science book here, this website that looks like this, you can browse and you can see all the stuff for the book. It's got like embedded code and everything. This is actually an R Markdown document made by the Bookdown package. And you can see the source for it on the page. You can go and look and see how it's been laid out. Um, and you can see that uh, every one of these chapters and things is just an RMD file. Um, I mean, I can click uh, on a random RMD and you can see there's like text for a single section um, and you can break up a RMD file into the sort of relatively complex um, RM, like separate files. Here's an entire chapter. This entire chapter is an RMD, but of the book, if I go look for this data tidying chapter on the book, um, where is it? Uh, I don't think it's in tidy data, actually. Is that it, actually? Yeah, maybe that's the actual section, right? So this entire, all the code to generate this uh, chapter was in one RMD file, but every one of these is a different RMD file here. You can organize it that way. Um, I like to use many small files. <clears throat> yeah. You got a lot of flexibility. It doesn't all have to be in one document. In fact, I rarely include any real R code in most of my R Markdown documents. I generally, because the stuff usually takes so much time to process, there's a lot of it. I usually have it in script files and my R and D files call out to those scripts instead of putting them in chunks. But that's just my workflow that I like. My stuff tends to be pretty large and involved. So I don't like to jam it all into an R and D. I mean, I think my dissertation is probably, the code is quite, in my opinion, efficient and compact and there's still probably 15,000 lines of code in it or something like that. I'm not going to jam that in an RMD file. Uh, so, anyway, um, yeah, I recommend our studio projects for things like a dissertation or this class, stuff like that. Like this entire class is one R project for me. Uh, my dissertation is three R, actually, like seven R projects, but the main chapters are three different R projects, just sort of isolated in their own. Oh, wait. Yeah, now this is the thing about when you, somebody says they have a lot of code. So in the real software development world, if somebody says, if somebody says like I wrote 10,000 lines of code to do something, everyone around them is going to assume they did something wrong. Like you want small compact code. Writing lots of code is usually a sign of like um, incompetence or unnecessary writing of code. Um, in my particular situation, I just have been working on this thing for many, many years, and it actually was doing a lot of different things. Um, so the code is big, but it's like there's a big difference between like 15,000 lines of code that aren't doing much and 15,000 lines of like nicely annotated. The other thing is like every piece of annotation you add to code adds a line to the code. So a lot of it's comments, documentation, built-in citations into the code, um, error checking, and things like that. So it's long. I'm just saying it's too big to put in an RMD. Um, but yeah. Anyway, talk about that more later in the term. Okay, so one thing to know, if you are a Windows user, if you copy a file path from your computer, uh, so for instance, if I have a folder up like this and I copy my file path like this into R, well, the unfortunate thing about Windows is the slashes go in the wrong direction. So Windows still uses the DOS style of writing directories where the slashes are going in the opposite direction that adult operating systems use their slashes. So everything Unix-based uses slashes like this to do their directories. Windows uses slashes that go the other direction. These are not equivalent. R expects forward slashes because it's a good operating system, because it's based on ideas of a good operating system and not Windows. Um, so you're going to have to change those all if you actually manually do Windows directories. You can't just copy and paste them in. Okay? The sort of backslash character here is reserved in R for marking off escape characters, um, which we'll talk about more in uh, week 
eight. Okay. So if you do need to set a working directory, okay, there are sometimes you'll want to do this, but usually you don't. But if you do, put set working directory at the very start of your file so that anybody who opens it will see a set working directory command in the first like dozen lines of code. That way, if somebody else and somebody else includes future you looks at this file, they will see a set working directory and be ready to go and modify. It. Okay, I still recommend not doing. It. Okay, so better way than working directories is to use our studios project features. They're in that top right drop down in our studio. So again, if I uh, let me mess up my uh, sizing here. Appearance. Um, so if you've got our studio open, project management occurs up here in the top right. This is a little project management tab. You can create new projects. You can open your existing projects. You can also have multiple projects open simultaneously in different R Studio windows, and they keep different global environments and everything, so nothing is shared. Okay, <clears throat> this is nice. If I want to browse between things, like this is C Triple S Five Hundred Eight, the class we're currently in. If I want to swap back to one of my dissertation chapters. All I have to do is press a button like this. I don't lose anything. And it takes me back to right exactly where I was working a minute ago. Um, and I can pick right back up with whatever I was doing. Okay? I really like project management like this. It's nice. Okay. Okay. There's a bunch of advantages to this. So it sets your working directory to be the project directory. Whatever is the top level directory of a project, wherever you create that project, when you swap to that project, it changes your working directory to that. So you don't have to mess with them at all if everything refers to that top level directory and its contents. It also remembers any objects in your workspace, your command history, et cetera, next time you reopen that project, if you have it set to do so. I actually have it set to not remember the objects, but I do have it set to remember um the like tabs i have open but i prefer to have our wipe everything every time i close it or change projects um nice thing about this is it reduces the risk of intermingling work if all the stuff for a given project is in one project everything for anything else is somewhere else when you swap between them you can't contaminate your workspace one of the most common problems that I encountered when I worked down at the Caesar consulting office in the basement of Savory is people would come to me with their homework problems and be like, I don't know why I get different results now than I did before. Or I don't know why this thing isn't working when it was working before. And usually it's because every homework assignment they'd ever done in that class was open in the same R Studio instance that they never wiped anything in the entire time they've been using R. And so they had all sorts of bizarre objects loaded all the time. I believe you should cleanse your R constantly so that every time the window is closed, it wipes everything in your global environment and forces you to start over. I think that's the only reasonable setting to have in R Studio. You should do that because it prevents contamination. Anyway, another thing, these projects are easy to integrate with version control. So if you have a project on your computer, that project could also be a Git repository and you can sort of have the project automatically updated via uh, get backed up, synchronized everything for you through that direct project. I just make it so every one of my GitHub repos is its own RStudio project. It manages everything. Okay. Um, yeah. So um, if you're interested in some more advanced sort of project management stuff, I have done a little bit of a presentation, which is probably a little dated by now, on reproducible research with RR tools. RR tools is a package by archaeologist Ben Marwick here on campus. Um, focused on making um, reproducible, distributable, dis distributable distributions of your journal articles, species, and dissertations, um, so that it kind of puts together stuff that's kind of like our studio project management features actually uses our studio projects, um, but it also links in uh, Git, uh, Travis tests, unit tests, and a few other things, Markdown, Bookdown, um, to kind of have an all-in-one solution to doing reproducible research. Yeah. So. With working directories, if you set a working directory or you're in an RStudio project, so you have some working directory that's there, you can refer to folders and files within that working directory, not just directly in the particular folder, but also with subfolders and above and folders above that one using relative pathing. So if I do something like this, I load up ggplot, I make some sort of basic plot in ggplot. 
if where I want to save that is not in my current working directory, but is instead in a subfolder called graphics, I can save it with the path graphics slash carsplot.png. And what R is going to do is it's going to save it in this subfolder graphics and then name it this. So this means you don't have to load and save files only in the directory, say, your markdown is in. You can browse to higher or lower level folders and save an open object. You might ask, well, what if I want to go to a lower level folder? So the thing I want to access is in one folder closer down to uh, my, my drive than the one I'm in. So like, let's say your working directory is your project folder, but your project folder is in a big one for your whole dissertation. You want some data in there. If you do period, period, slash, it will browse up a directory and then look in that folder. So you can go either direction, up folders or down folders and find stuff. Okay. So, uh, yep, already said that. So relative paths are really nice. The thing about relative paths is cool um, is that you can change the locations of all loaded and saved files just by changing the working directory. And it also means that if you say grab the entire project folder and put it on a flash drive and give it to someone, all of the working directory stuff works because they're relative to the location of the project. It's portable and you can transfer it to somebody else. Everything works. You never have to change the uh, working directory commands anywhere in the, in the files. This is really nice and is a way to make your stuff portable. Non-portable stuff is not reproducible, so you should make your stuff portable. Easiest way is I'll use nothing but relative paths and things that set your working directory automatically. Okay. All right. So that's all I got on directories. I know it's exciting to talk about file paths on your computer, but let's move on to something uh, a little bit more probably useful too. Let's talk about importing and exporting data. Okay. So first thing to say, um, sometimes importing and exporting data isn't actually necessary at all, and there's better ways to do it. So if you're working with some popular data source, the first thing you should do is Google, not even a popular data source. I really just mean a data source that some other people have used. Um, there might be an R package uh, that will load and manage that data for you, so you don't have to import it manually at all. So here's a couple, a few examples of these things like uh, World Development Indicator, World Health Organization's API, Tidy Census. We're going to learn in uh, Lecture Nine is for getting Census and American Community Survey data from the U.S. Census Bureau. Um, there's a million of these packages that will. Uh, pull down data from common sources. So you don't have to import, you don't have to go manually download. It just pulls them straight down through the internet connection, through the magic of the interwebs and delivers to you data, often in a nice format, especially something like tidy census. So you never have to go like onto some website and deal with their crude interface to download things. Nothing pisses me off more than when I need a major data source and they don't have a package or API for me to download it. Like I hate going on like IPMs or something like that and manually selecting data sets to download. It's a waste of my time. Something like tidy census that allows me to pull down exactly what I want programmatically is the way everything in the world should be. So you'll get to see some of that in a week now. Okay, if you're lucky, you got something like this, you don't have to import or export manually. So aside from a package like that, the easiest way to get external data into R is if it is stored in some sort of delimited text file. An example of a delimited text file is comma separated value or tab separated value spreadsheets. These are CSV and TSV files. If you open up a text file and your text file looks something like this, where you have some values maybe quoted, maybe not quoted, they're separated by commas, at the end of a line, it looks like there's nothing and it goes to the next line. There's actually an invisible character here called the line break character. Anyway, this is comma separated value data because the individual values are separated by commas. The difference between this and TSV files is instead of a comma, there's a tab. Okay? These are delimited files because the data, individual elements of the data are separated by some delimiter. Could be a comma, a tab. I've seen some weird shit out there. I've seen and delimited files, colon delimited files. I saw an A delimited file once, literally just the letter, letter A was the delimiter, so you couldn't use A anywhere inside the data. There's weird stuff out there. You can do any kind of delimiter manually with functions in R for whatever you want. Okay? Ideally, CSV is what you're going to encounter. So 
R has built-in functions for importing data stored in text files like these. These functions are things like read.table, which is a general version, and read.csv, which is specific to comma-separated values. I generally recommend instead using the tidyverse versions in the reader package. These are read underscore CSV, underscore TSV, and underscore delim, plus a few other ones. So these ones work basically the same way as the ones built into R, but they have a few minor advantages. One, they tend to be a little bit faster. They take some shortcuts in reading the data in that usually doesn't cause problems, but can really greatly accelerate how quickly they load in. Big one is they have better default defaults. This is actually no longer true. I keep forgetting to talk about strings, uh, strings as factors equals false. It used to be the base R ones automatically converted every piece of character data into factors. Luckily, they don't do that anymore. Um, but there's other defaults that are better. They're good at detecting things like dates and times and automatically making them date and time data, which is kind of nice. They also have a function built in called problems. If you load in your data, you can type problems and it will tell you in detail the sort of errors that occurred when reading the data in if there's some weird stuff, common weird stuff with like merged cells and stuff like that. Like Excel always likes to butcher things. Um, stuff like that, it'll let you know what the issues are. It also has loading bars for big files, which can be nice if you're working with really large CSVs. You want a status update, you know it's not that R is crashed or something. It's loading, it's just big. If you're dealing with CSV files that are like multiple gigabytes in size, I like loading bars. Okay. There's also a package I'll talk about a couple times this term. If you're loading really big CSV files and you want speed, don't use Reader, use the Vroom package. Vroom is super fast. Uh, it's for loading like really big CSVs. Okay. So here's an example of reading some data in using Reader. These are the data that we're going to use later in this lecture for pivoting. So this is the Billboard Hot 100 of the year 2000. So when I was in high school, um, these were the hot songs of the day. So we load this in by saying, I'm going to create the Billboard 2000 raw data. I'm going to do that by using read CSV, and I give it a file location. You'll notice here, this file location is a web address. You can give to R URLs and have it directly query and download a remote file. CSVs and stuff don't have to be on your computer. You can pull them down. It figures out how to do those queries in the background for you, so you don't have to worry about it. Okay, so if we pull this one down from GitHub, Reader is going to load in and tell us some stuff right off the bat. So this will look like an error message to you if you've never used it before, but it's not. It's useful information. It is instead a message. This is saying these are the specifications Reader decided to read in all the data as. It's just letting you know how it guessed what the formats are. It's saying I'm going to default to double, which is a type of numeric column for all columns. The things that are not double data, the artist column came in as character data, track came in as character. It saw a time format, automatically thought it looked like time data and formatted it as time data. The date entered, it saw that and was like, that looks like a date. So it formatted as date. And then it formatted a bunch of these, the week 66 through 76 columns as logical. Formatting things as logical typically happens when those columns are all blank because logical columns take up the least data in your at least space in your RAM. So if there's nothing in them, R will load it in as a logical to save you as much memory as possible. Okay, it's a lot of information right there, but I'm telling you, this thing is smart. It has reasons for choosing the column types. Okay, so thing that that conveys to us, for instance, is like I said, it loaded in a whole bunch of columns as logical. When you see reader load in a logical, it usually means there's something weird about that column. Perhaps there's a whole bunch of missing data. That's exactly the case here. If I say, give me the structure of my Billboard 2000 raw data and then look only at the 65th through end of my data columns. So this says, give me column 65 through the number of columns in the data set as a whole. There's like, what, uh, 80 something columns. This is what those data look like. You'll see week 60 through 65 here are numeric data. They're mostly missing values, but they're numerics. 
but 66 and on, which look like they should be the same columns, just guessing by the names of the columns, are coming in logical instead. Okay, this is a thing that typically occurs, like I said, when these columns are actually completely blank in the entire column and readers like, there's no data there, I'm gonna load it in because it exists, but it's, I'm just gonna load it as a logical because there's nothing in there. It could instead be a bunch of ones and zeros, which is also possible, um, or it could be a bunch of trues and falses, though typically if it's the text true and false, it will load in as character. Okay, we're gonna deal with all these NAs later today. So what went wrong here? There's two potential things that went wrong here. One, nothing could have gone wrong and there actually are nothing but missing values here. But another thing that could have resulted in all those logical columns at the end um, is that reader actually doesn't look at the entire file before figuring out what column types to use. So the idea is that reader only looks at the first thousand or so rows of your data and uses those thousand rows to guess how to assign the column types. The reason it only looks at the first thousand is it speeds up loading a lot. If you're loading a file that has 100 million rows, it goes a lot faster if reader doesn't have to read all 100 million rows before deciding how to allocate that memory in your computer. So it reads about 1,000 rows and then guesses based on what it sees how to, how to assign data types to the columns. The thing is, is there aren't many songs in the data because it's the Billboard Hot 100 of the year 2000. There's only 52 weeks in the year, but some songs charted starting way before the year started and go way past when the year ends if they spent the entire year on the billboard. There's not many songs that charted for 60 plus weeks. And in fact, there aren't any in that first thousand rows that charted for 66 plus weeks. So it just assigned logical to it. Okay, since it encountered no values, it assumes some are character. In this case, it assumed 66 through 76 were actually logicals um, saying, I don't think there's anything there, I'm assigned an NA. So if you're working with a data set like this and you want to manually assign column types, and I actually recommend doing this with data sets you're working with a lot, um, you can manually assign column types given a vector of letters where each letter is a column in your data set. I'll show you what this is here. So the way this is used is I create a big long set of uh, data types I assign it to an item, to an object here, and then I say read CSV, the same file as before, column types equals this vector. Well, what is this vector? Tab not working for me. There we go. So this vector right here is this. So you can see here, this is I, C, 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 capital D, and then 76 lowercase i's. So the length of this thing here, 76 plus five, there are 81 columns in this data set. Each one of these letters corresponds in order to a column in the data set. This says the first column is integer, the next three are character data, the fifth one is date, and every remaining column is integer data. You often don't need to do this but it's good to know that you can manually specify column types for your data sets this way. It can be a useful thing if you have weird column types or you want to be very specific that some things are dates or not dates, right? Prevent those sort of Excel style errors of reading everything in as a date. Okay, so good to know about that. I do it here just so we don't have to deal with those column types later, but you could see how this works without it. You'll probably get the same results. Another solution you can do is you could just increase the number of rows reader looks at before guessing column types. You could say read CSV the file and just increase the max it checks for up to the maximum length of the file and then it will just look at everything. And it's another solution you could do. Okay, you could also just use read CSV. What read CSV does is literally that. Read CSV just looks at every row and then goes. So if you do guess max equal to the length of the file, read CSV underscore CSV and read dot CSV will end up being the same speed. That's basically where the most of the speed gains come from. Okay, normally this won't be a problem. Though. Okay, another alternative is to use something like Vroom. Vroom is a high speed package for reading text files. You can say, look in the Vroom package, inside that the function Vroom, give it a file. Okay. Vroom will read things really quickly, shockingly fast, in fact. 
Another cool thing about Vroom is unlike read CSV, if instead of a single file here, you give it a vector of file locations, it will read all those files in sequentially and stick them together into a single data frame. So Vroom can take an entire directory of files and read them in off of one command and staple them together into a data frame. I love Vroom. I use it all the time. The thing is, though, it has less error checking than Reader. So it's the type of thing you use on files you already know are a pretty good format. The Reader one, read underscore CSV, is good if you've never opened a file before. It'll let you know what's wrong with it. Okay. Otherwise, I like using Vroom. There's some other options out there too. If you use like data.table, it's uh, I think it's fre and data.table is about as fast as Vroom. It's a good way to load data into. Okay. So that's for CSV files, TSV files, whatever garbage delimiter file you find. For Excel files, things that are like .xls or .xlsx, I recommend using the read Excel package to read them in and the write Excel package to write them. Okay, so it's separate packages to read and write. If you're working with Google Docs, I recommend using the Google Sheets 4 package, which will pull data down directly from Google Docs and also update Google Documents dynamically. So it's bi-directional communication with Google Docs, so you don't have to download files. Okay, the thing about any of these are, um, if you have any text formatting, colors, comments, or merged cells in your Excel files, these things will not keep them. It will discard that information. So the thing is, is if you have any useful information stored in your Excel spreadsheets as metadata, metadata is anything that is not a textual value in a cell, you are doing something that is an affront to science and you should stop doing that. Things like color, formatting of your text, comments, and merged cells are all things that only exist inside the proprietary software of Excel, which are very difficult to extract and are generally not reproducibly extractable, okay? Don't do that. If something is useful, store it as normal data in a column. Anything that cannot be converted from an Excel sheet directly into a CSV without any loss is bad and you should stop doing it. In fact, I highly recommend just using only CSVs because all the added features of Excel files are garbage. Okay, so that out of the way. Um, if an Excel sheet that you're stuck with because somebody else created it and it's their fault, if some Excel sheet gives you grief because they've done things like merged cells, maybe it's got headers, decorative stuff in there, um, the simplest thing to do is to open it up and export it to a CSV file and then import it to R and just skip the whole thing. You can actually make R dynamically convert the Excel into a CSV, but that might make it come out in an ugly format. So if you need to programmatically work with non-tabular Excel sheets, that is things that have merged cells, or you actually need to pull out the colors, the comments, all that kind of stuff as real data, you can do it. You can do that using packages like Unpivoter and Tidy Excel. These ones can digest all of that hideous Excel code and return it as information in list objects in R so that you can keep all that. I generally recommend doing everything possible to avoid doing it, but sometimes you're gonna get some sort of secondary data format from somebody. Maybe it's gonna be from some administrative organization. It's always admin data. Um, and you're gonna have to deal with it. Look up Unpivoter and Tidy Excel. They are ludicrously powerful, but that power comes at the price of having to know how to use it. So hopefully avoid it, but if not, there you go. Okay, so if you wanna get data out of R and make it a delimited file, it's super easy. If you wanna make a CSV file in Reader, the function is write underscore CSV. You give it an R object, you tell it what you want that file to be named and where to put it, and it will spit out a CSV. So doing this right here, if you were following along, immediately save the data we pulled off the web into a file called billboard.csv in my current working directory. It just writes it to disk. There you go. Okay, so the thing about a CSV file, which is both wonderful and terrible, is CSV files do not have any sort of metadata. Once you write something to a CSV, there's no way for that CSV to communicate to another piece of software what type of data is in each column. So you don't know, for instance, if it's supposed to be a character column, a factor column, 
Um, piece of software will just assume something is numeric if it sees numeric values, for instance. Um, CSVs don't carry metadata. If you want to save things in R and maintain metadata, that is things like you want to keep your column types, you want to save it in an R format. So if you're going to maybe run a bunch of data manipulation, you want to write an object to disk and then open it up in another script to run models, you want to save the intervening object in an R format. Okay. So an R format includes, for instance, RDS files. RDS files are files you use to save a single R object, and they don't save its object name. They save all the contents, all the names of any elements of it, but they don't save the name of the object itself. What you would do is you'd say, write RDS, the object in your environment you want to save, the location you want to write it to. When you read it in, you have to read it in, and if you want to use it, you have to assign it to a new object. You would say, read in RDS, the particular path I saved it to, assign it to a new object name, and this thing would contain everything that was in the old object name, it just wouldn't maintain its original name, you just renamed it here. So if you got a single file or a single object in R and you want to save, RDS files are a good way to do it. In general though, I basically always use this format instead, which is .rdata or RDA format. This is used for saving multiple objects, I say files, but multiple objects where the original object names are preserved. Okay? So you can say, save object one, comma, object two, comma, object three, as many objects as you want. You could save your entire global environment that way. If you save your entire global environment that way, that's actually what RStudio does by default when you close it. It just runs the save command on every object currently in your global environment and then loads it up afterwards. Okay. So you could save as many objects as you want. You can also save only one object. You save it to a path. But when you load, when you load here, you don't do assignment. You say load that file. You don't do it in the assignment because what happens is it loads it in and keeps those object names. It sends them straight to your global environment. You can use which one of these methods you want. It doesn't matter. They're basically equivalent for operations. You'll see a lot of people who prefer to always use RDS. You see some people like me who always use R data. It doesn't matter. Do whichever one you like. Okay. Um, I just do our data, so you'll typically see me do that. Okay. So another thing to know about isn't exactly um, saving files to disk, but as a good way to transmit something to somebody. When you're asking people for help with our code or something, sometimes you just want to be able to email them a snippet of data. You can do this with dput. The dput command here, anything you put inside of a dput command, dput will spit out the necessary text to recreate this object in your environment. So you can say, for instance, here is head of the car's data, the first eight rows, dput. This code right here, if you load this or run this in your console, it will recreate the first eight rows of the car's data frame with all relevant uh, observations, all the actual info, and the correct like row names and metadata on the column types. Okay, this is useful for transmitting things via email. So what you would do is you'd copy and paste this here, run this command here, save it to an object, and this temp now contains everything that was in that original uh, head cars eight call. Okay, you can just reproduce things. An even better way to do this is there's a tidyverse uh, thing called a reprex, which is a reproducible R object that you can essentially email to people. Um, and it is still raw text like this, but dput is good enough for most purposes. In an ideal world, if you email me for help in the deep future, I appreciate it if you dput me a few rows of your data as an example, it makes it a lot easier for me to run things. Okay, so good things to know about. So, if you don't have a CSV file or you don't want to write a CSV file, what happens when you're working with other people who use other types of software? Maybe working with people who use Stata or SPSS, something like that. Um, or you're given these files. It's quite common, maybe you get some data off ICPSR, they come in Stata or SPSS format. So you can use a package to bring in data files from these other formats. The tidyverse one I like is Haven. Haven has functions to load in 
Stata files, SPSS files, SAS files, and a couple other proprietary formats. They get loaded in in a, in a slightly complex format in some cases, but they retain everything. These are really nice because they retain Stata labels, SPSS labels on variables and stuff like that, which our files normally can't store. It keeps them all. Makes them a little harder to work with, but it means you don't lose anything. There's also the foreign package built into R for Stata, but only Stata before version 13. So Stata 12 and older files, SPSS, mini tab, and stuff like that. So for less common formats, just Google it. There's something out there for it. As I think I said before in this class, I've yet to encounter a data format that doesn't have an R package to handle it, or at least some hack to handle it. Okay, I've handled some bizarre files over the years. There's always something out there, um, not counting like encrypted files, because that's not an R issue. That's just, it's actually an encrypted file. Okay, if you encounter a mysterious file extension, you're given a file that someone claims is data, but they haven't told you what it is and it has no documentation. Maybe it's something like .dat, the most useless file extension in history. .dat, my first recommendation is, one, get a good text editor. Every text editor built into modern operating systems is shit, and you should get a different text editor. You should get something like Atom or Sublime or something else like that, or if you're one of those people, Emacs or Vim, Vim right? Um, get one of those. Open it. If it opens and it looks like actual text, congratulations, it's a delimited text file or a fixed format file, and R can definitely handle it. If you open it up and it looks like something bizarre with lots of special characters, um, most likely it's some kind of binary format and you're going to have to track down the source of it and figure out how to open it. Okay. So that's all I got on formats and stuff. If you have any questions, uh, let me know and we'll transition here to talking about tidying data. What slide am I on? 20 and one third. How about we take like two or three minutes for the first time ever in this class? All right. We'll start back up at like 419. Go if you need to stretch your legs. Or if you need to ask me questions right now, I'm not going anywhere. Normally when I run workshops, I've always got nice spacing. I have plenty of time. But over years of teaching this class, I just keep cramming more stuff in and I'm unable to remove things. So I did remove a few slides this term. So they always run long. I see a hand up. What you got? Uh, yeah, I just want to count uh, the NAs in this matrix. You just want to count the number of NAs in an entire matrix? Yeah, yeah, I want to know how many are in here. Just do uh, sum is dot NA or matrix. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, I'm just trying to see if I got them all out or not. <laughs> Another one you could do instead also is uh, I like using table typically because table will tell you how many are NA, but also tell you how many are not NA. It's kind of a nicer uh, little display. I had a question. Yeah. Um, how do I get rid of the, of like old objects in like the top right corner. Like I, there's some like old projects from like a long time ago and I don't know how to like stop seeing them. Okay, I will show you two things. Uh, the first one is normally what I like to do is just plain have the setting turned on that wipes it, wipes R every time you close it. So if you look down in the uh, basic tab general over here, um, look down here where it says workspace and it says restore.rdata into workspace at startup uncheck that and then save workspace to our data on exit never then every single time you close our studio it will wipe everything in the environment i recommend that okay. most commonly. another thing is that you actually do want to delete everything everything visible in your global environment in the top right there's a specific command for that which is rm list equals ls that will wipe everything visible in your global environment it doesn't unload packages um, but it will remove any, anything in your global environment. Yeah. Because right. what this is actually saying is RM is the command to remove things, to delete an object. LS is display everything currently in your global environment. So this is literally just saying, get me the names of everything in the global environment and then remove them all. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. 
Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I'll pick back up again. Um, let us talk about tidying data. We've been talking about the tidy verse and a little bit about tidy data. Let's talk about tidying data, getting into a tidy format, and also what that tidy format actually is. So these, um, our Tidyverse has all of these nice logos, um, beautiful logos like this. They have these incredible like chrome, beautiful stickers that you can put on like your laptop and stuff. I'm addicted to them. I have many of them. Anyway, just a plug. So they come in nice chrome format. Anyway, so tidying data. So when you first load in a data set, I recommend looking at a few things every time when you load in a new data set. Once you've looked at a data set thoroughly before, you don't need to do it again, but these are just initial spot checks. You get some new administrative data set. Maybe the Seattle Police Department has sent me another police, another data set. Lauren is usually not cruel to me and doesn't usually give me terrible data, but maybe he did to surprise me this time. I will run through essentially these checks. So first things to look at. Did the last rows and columns from the file make it in? Okay, so I say here the last rows and columns. If you load in a new data set, you will notice immediately if the first rows and columns loaded in wrong. You might forget to look at the end of it though. Typically, if something loads in badly in a file, it's either gonna be all of it and you'll see it immediately or it's going to be stuff at the end. It's rare to have a file load in where everything at the beginning and the end is fine and everything in the middle is terrible. It happens, but normally right off the bat, I will check the last rows and columns, make sure there's no non-missing values or butchered values. If there are, you might need to do things like use a different package to load the data in or different commands or manually specify the range of the data. This is common when somebody gives you an Excel sheet that they've been manually editing a lot and it just has lots of extra rows and columns all over the place because any place that they touched in Excel, it made it a permanent row and column type thing. Good to look at these things. Okay, next one. Are column names in good shape? Very often you load in a file and the column names will load in very strangely. Maybe they had spaces in them, maybe they had characters that aren't supported by R, whatever. You might need to modify the column names by specifying them directly or fix them with rename or use something like the janitor package to automate the process of fixing your column names. Other things, big one. Are there decorative blank rows or columns you have to remove? This is really common for uh, spreadsheets that humans have interacted with in any way. Um, they'll have like extra spaces that have some annotation or something like that, or maybe just random rows and columns. You might need to filter them out, select them out, or when you read the data in, limit it to a certain range, like saying start by reading it in at the third row or something. You can do all that sort of stuff in reader package commands. That might just be a way to get rid of these things. Next, huge one. Okay, look at the data, look at the spreadsheet and figure out how missing values are represented. Are they actual NA values? Are they blank values? Are they things like periods or 999s? There is a reasonably famous case in the discipline of demography where a paper was published about the relationship between marital satisfaction and frequency of intercourse. They found that there was a very odd relationship where people who had a lot of intercourse were very unhappy, but otherwise there was a linear relationship. And they were trying to figure out if it had something to do with some sort of like wild lifestyles or something like that. No, it was because 99 was a missing value in their data. And the people who reported doing it 99 times a month were actually saying missing values. They were refusing to report how often they did it and they happened to be unhappy. So be careful about knowing what your missing values in your data are so you don't have a lifelong embarrassing story to tell your students and other people in your discipline. Okay, so look at this. Resolve them in some way. You could do things like mutate them with if else statements to fix them. You could loop over many columns or iterate over many columns, or you can actually give reader functions a vector of values to replace with NAs while they're loading in, which is the way I like to do it. Okay. So next one, another common one, are there character data that are being incorrectly represented as numeric data or numeric data incorrectly represented as character data? 
This is common with zip codes. Zip codes look like numbers, but they aren't meaningful numbers. They contain only numeric digits, but increasing a zip code from 98105 to 98106 doesn't indicate anything about their relationship, except that they're probably contiguous or semi-contiguous. And if the number is higher in the large scale, it probably means it's further west than the other ones, right? There's almost no numeric information meaningful in zip codes. So don't load them in as numeric data. They have leading zeros. If you're in the Northeast, there are zip codes that begin with zero. It will discard them if they're treated as numeric data, okay? Other things are sometimes you'll load in numeric data that has like periods or commas in it that actually accidentally get read in as character data. You may need to modify that to make it read in appropriately as numeric data. You can do this with the column types arguments or afterwards mutate them and do things like as character or as numeric. If you load in a zip code and then afterwards mutate it as character, you won't get those leading zeros back though. You'd have to add them. We'll talk about how to do that in week eight. Okay, so I like to do basically all of these things and plus some other things, but these are sort of generally things I will always look at in a new data set. Okay, so once you're past that, let's say you have data that are a little bit messy Maybe they look something like this, something which doesn't look messy to most people who consume data like this. So these are actual data, our actual-ish data, I should say, from a prior term of this class, some, some years back. It's actually the very first person who taught this class is data. So this was different programs, different sort of uh, schools in the University of Washington, like the Evans School of Public Policy, the Arts and Sciences, Public Health, other. Um, and then the gender of respond or uh, gender of people tracked in this data set. So either woman or man and a count. 10 people, five people, two people, five people, six, six, three, and one. Okay, this is a table that a human can consume very easily. They know exactly what it is in there, what, what this is in here. This is, however, not an ideal format for doing like analyses. So if you look at this, you might think to yourself, what is an actual observation of data here? An observation of data is a group of students from a program of a given gender. So that's, for instance, there were 10 women from the Evans School. That is one observation in these data. So if you think about it, the variables in this data set are the program those people are in, and then gender, but gender is in two columns instead of one, okay? So the actual values for the gender variable are in the column names of these two columns when they should instead actually be just recorded in their own column for most sort of like statistical analyses type things. The count is the number of students. It should be in one column instead of spread over two columns. There should be a column for the program, a column for the gender, and a column for the count of people of that gender in that program. But instead we have this. This tabular data is nice for humans, but it's bad for computer. Okay. What we want instead is something that looks like this. This is the tidy version of the same data set. We have each variable in a column. We have the program, the gender, and the count of people we have each observation in a row. An observation is, for instance, the Evans School women count of 10. That is one observation contained entirely in one row. This sort of thing is now immediately ready to throw into ggplot. I could, for instance, make a bar plot stratified by gender and get program level by gender counts of people on a bar plot using these data. This one could not go into ggplot nicely because these two counts, even though they're the same variable, are in two different columns and you would struggle to figure out how to make it work in ggplot. And the thing I would inevitably tell you in chat is you simply need to reformat your data to look like this because this format is what it's expecting. This is tidy format. Okay, I'll talk, revisit this in a second and we'll talk about the exact specifications of what tidy data are, but just keep this idea in mind in the abstract. The billboard data that I have loaded in that we're gonna use for the rest of this lecture is beyond slightly messy. It is hideous. It's not administrative data hideous, but it's pretty terrible. Okay, this is what it looks like. 
We have, for instance, it begins with a useless column, the year 2000. Well, it is the hot 100 of the year 2000. There is only one value of year in the data set. It has the artist. That looks fine. Tupac, three doors down, you name it. The track of the song, Baby Don't Cry. The length the song was, four minutes and 22 seconds. From here on out, it gets weird, OK? The next column is the date it entered the Billboard Hot 100. That's fine. You're like, oh, this one entered on February 26, 2000 and was on the Billboard Hot 100 beginning then and afterwards. Then there are 76 columns for the week it was on the Billboard. This says, this 87 says, on February 26, when this song entered the Billboard Hot 100, this was ranked 87. So week one right here is not like chronological week of the year. It's the week the song was on the chart and what rank it was, and up to 76 entries for the rank it was in weeks all across it. So this means the value of week one here is not the same week as the observation below it. And it means that if a song was on the Billboard Hot 100 for only three weeks like this one, every value from week four to week 76 is missing afterwards, just blanks because it wasn't on the Billboard Hot 100. This is a super wide data format. It is a stupid format. And what we're going to do for much of the rest of today is get it into a less stupid format that we could use. How, for instance, if you had data in this format, would you plot the rank of songs over time on a ggplot? Would you be able to? What would you do? You have 76 columns containing the rank of a song. Are you going to do 76 individual calls to G on point to plot each one of those ranks? Horrible. No, the answer is not. What we're going to do is we're going to convert it. So instead of 76 columns of week, we have one column that says what week it is and one column saying what rank it was in that week. That format is long, tidy data and ready for ggplot and ready for every statistical method in R except for structural equation models. Okay, we'll get there. So on the billboard hot 100, what is an actual observation in this data set? An actual observation here is not a song. It is a week since entering the Billboard Hot 100 per song. So an observation, a single song can have many observations. They could be on the Billboard many times and have different ranks in every one of those observations. But the actual observation is the rank it was, or the week since entering the Billboard Hot 100 and what rank it was in that week. So this tells us immediately we're going to get many observations per song or many rows per song because the actual observations, sometimes there's multiples per song. In fact, usually there are. Next, what are the variables in the data? Some of these are obvious, some are less obvious. Obvious ones are the year, which is useless, the artist, the track, the song length, and date entered it hit the Hot 100. But then the less obvious ones are the week since first entering the Hot 100 is a variable in our data, but it's spread over 76 columns. And then the rank it was during that week is spread over those 76 columns. These are two variables which just happen to occupy 76 columns instead when they really should be in their own columns. OK, the values in the data set, yeah, they're pretty obvious. Year 2000, three doors down, kryptonite. It was 3 minutes and 53 seconds long. It entered the billboard on April 8th. In week three, it was rank 68. Okay? The thing is, is the value week three is stuck all the way up in a column header. It isn't even in the row for this particular song at all. And the rank over here, rank 68, is located some column way off to the right. That is the week three column, when it should really just be in some overall rank column. Okay. So. Let's talk about what tidy data are so that we can get them into that format. Tidy data is another term for long data. If you've ever taken a class on like longitudinal or mod modeling of some kind, you've probably always been using long data and have heard it called long data. Long data, tidy data, same idea. These data are data that are one, 
They have all the values for a single observation in their own row. Everything for an observation is in one row and only one row. All the values for any single variable are all in that column and only that column, nothing is spread across multiple columns. And then within each cell of the table, that is a given combination of row and column, there is only one value in that cell. There are not multiple values in that cell. That is the simple tidy data um, definition. Okay. This is actually derived, if you, if you have a, a relatively deep knowledge of relational databases, this is actually borrowed from the information theory behind rela uh, relational databases. But anyway, the idea is there's only one value per cell there. The thing is, though, is that one value per cell need not be a single like number. It just needs to be what you consider to be a single value for the thing you're currently doing. There are situations where that one value could, for instance, be an entire data set or an entire model set of model results. But if that's the one value you're interested in for your purpose, there's only one value per cell. Okay, so it's subjective. We won't get do much of that in this class, but you can do things like in a data frame, you can stuff a data frame in a single cell of a data frame. R is happy to let you do some interesting things. Okay, so why do we want tidy data? So. A big one is just sort of looking at it. Tidy data is much easier for a person to digest than wide data. Um, I don't know the exact cognitive reason for this, but if you give somebody the same data in a wide format and a long format, they will find it much more of a pain to deal with the one with many, many columns than the one with many, many rows. We are, for some reason, a little bit better at working vertically than horizontally. I don't know why. In every case I've ever seen, it's always been drastically easier for me to deal with the long data. Okay, next one. It's required for plotting in ggplot pragmatically. If you want to visualize your data using the ggplot subsystem, it's going to expect long data. So you just kind of pragmatically want to get it there. Next, similarly, it's also required for many types of statistical procedures. The nice thing about ggplot is it expects data in the same format as most statistical routines. So if you formatted your data properly for like hierarchical models, standard linear models, longitudinal panel models, all that stuff. If they're formatted properly for that, they're also formatted properly for ggplot. Use the same format. Another one, long data, by its very definition, always has way more rows and fewer columns, which means there's fewer variable names, so it's easier to track where things are. I have a data set I kind of help run and administer called the Denver Use Survey. It has like 87,000 columns. It's a wide data set. It's really hard to have nice, unique identifications of 87,000 columns. You have to come up with naming schemes and things, and you sure can't browse around it. When I do real work with it, I make it long data. Another one, um, turns out long data takes up less space on your hard disk and in your RAM than wide data does, which might be somewhat unintuitive. The reason for it is it has fewer missing values. If you remember back when I showed you the Billboard uh, Hot 100, there was a song that had was on the Billboard Hot 100 for three weeks. Because it was only on three weeks, it meant that it had 73 columns with missing values in it, but R still has to allocate a tiny bit of space to that. In long format, instead of having explicit missing values, you simply don't have any rows there it ends up taking up substantially less space. We're gonna see that with the Billboard Hot 100 when we drastically reduce the size of the data set by discarding things that don't exist at all. Wide data tends to contain lots of things which actually don't exist and just waste space. Okay, so long data, many advantages. It's rare that you actually need wide data for things. There are some examples though, some statistic routines like structural equations tend to require wide data. But what I do, and I do, sadly, most of my work is structural equation modeling. If I do SEM, I do everything in tidy data right up to before it goes into the model, and then I make it wide. Okay. So the package for taking data and making it go from wide to long or long to wide in R is the tidy R package. Tidy R gives you functions to do these things that are similar to ones in SPSS and Stata, like reshape and vars to cases. The key functions in the Tidy R package are things like pivot longer, the workhorse, 
Pivot longer takes a set of columns and pivots them down to make two new columns, which you can name yourself. It will take a, it will create a name column that will store all the old column names and a value column that stores all the values that were in the original columns. The inverse of this is pivot wider. Pivot wider takes two columns and pivots them up into many columns where the first column you give it becomes the column names. The second column you give it is the values inside those columns. There's also separate, which will take one column and divide it up into multiple columns. This is usually for cases where you have uh, two observations in a single cell and you want to break it up into multiple columns. We'll see examples of this in a minute. There's a simple version that's called extract numeric, which just rips the numbers out and discards everything else. And there's another function I will not cover today called extract. Extract is for complex pivoting, where you need to pivot a column into many sets of columns and not just one set of columns. If you want to know how to use this, I actually really like this one stack overflow question here. You can go and look at it if you're interested. I'm not going to cover it in this class. I find I very rarely have ever had to use extract, even for pretty complicated operations. Okay, so let's talk about pivot longer. <clears throat> Pivot longer um, is what we're going to use here to take those 76 weak and rank columns and turn them into two columns and get ourselves some long data. So what I'm going to do here, I load up tidy R and I load up dplyr. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my billboard 2000 raw data. I'm going to modify it and assign it to a new billboard 2000 object. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take billboard 2000 raw and then pivot longer. I'm going to say I would like to pivot every column that begins with the text WK. This starts with WK is the same syntax used in dplyr select function. It's the same function. So you can use anything used in select to pick columns. So I say it starts with weak. Then what I say is I want the names of all these columns that start with WK, their names to go into a new column called weak, and their values to go into a new column called rank, because the values underneath the weak columns was the rank the song was in that week. If I get the new dimensions of Billboard 2000 after pivoting, it now has a whopping 24,092 rows and only seven columns which is the original five ID columns, and then two new columns, which are the 76 original columns pivoted into weak and rank. Okay, so let's see what we did. This is what the Billboard 2000 data look like now. They are now repeated observation data. I have still year, artist, track, the time of the song, and the date entered, but for Tupac's Baby Don't Cry, these are all exactly the same for every row of that song. What's new is we have a week and rank column where week is week one, two, three, four, five, and six. And the rank is the rank the song was in that week. It was 87 and one, 82 and two, 72 and three, and so on, okay? We now have a single week column, a single rank column. These are long data. You could immediately send this into ggplot and plot ranks over weeks. Be a little upset about this week column because it's character data, not numeric data. So we're going to deal with that in a second. Do I, you understand exactly what I did here? Went from 76 columns to two. Is there any questions about that? where these values came from. WK1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, remember, were the old column names. And this happened to be that song's values under that column. Any questions? Quick clarification. Is it still, so we still need to interpret this as like the week one for each song is different based on the date entered, right? So that yeah. the interpretation of that has not changed yet. Nope, we're going to get okay. there when I play with uh, the Lubridate functions to work with dates. Okay, yeah. thank we'll you. Okay, right. so now something about this, as I mentioned before, missing values. If I say, let's get a summary of the Billboard 2000 data, specifically its rank column, we see here, okay, the minimum value of one makes sense. The best rank you can get on Billboard Hot 100 is number one. The worst you should be able to get is 100. 
but there's something odd here. Well, maybe not odd. You probably anticipated it from what I said earlier. There are 18,785 missing values here. The whole data frame is only 24,000 long, so the majority of it's missing data. The reason for that is every week that a song was not on the Billboard Hot 100, it still had an NA value in the original data set. We've just pivoted them down, and now all those times when any given song was not on the Billboard are still in our data. They're just missing values. Okay? We don't actually want these. The song was not on the Billboard Hot 100, so we can get rid of those rows. Okay, we can do this automatically in Pivot Longer. So I could filter them out by just removing all the things that are NAs on rank, but I could just make Pivot do it for me. If I take the same command I did before, so this down to here is the exact same command I ran a couple slides ago. Take the Billboard 2000 raw, pivot longer, all the columns that start with week, give the names to the week column, values to the rank column. But now I say values drop NA equals true. This says if the resulting row would have an NA value for the value column, which is rank, drop it. Okay. Well, the only things that have an NA value are things that weren't on the damn chart in that week, so we can discard them. I do that, I get summary billboard rank. It still has a minimum of one, a maximum of 100, but there's no NAs left because every single one of the NAs that was in, in this value co values column got dropped, okay? Now the resulting data is the actual non-missing legitimate observations of the Billboard Hot 100, which is only 5,307 rows, okay? So we just discarded the vast majority of our data set because it actually conveyed new information. The song wasn't on the Billboard Hot 100 at the time, so you don't need that observation. We lose nothing, except we make it much smaller and more manageable. Okay. Next, <clears throat> one thing is that week column we created. If I do summary Billboard 2000 dollar sign week, it says it's a length 5,307 character vector. It is a numeric week, but R doesn't know that because we haven't told it it's actually a numeric sequential week that we want to be able to do something with. So tidy R has a convenience function that will grab numeric information out of a column if it contains both character and numeric data. This is this kind of case here where what we want to do is we have a column that looks like this. The week column has WK1. Well, we actually only want the number one. We could discard the WK, get the one, and then convert it to numeric. That's what we're going to do. So what I say here is let's take the Billboard 2000 data, which I created before, and then mutate week equals parse number week. What this does is it goes down and pulls out only the numbers and throws away all the character data. If I now get a summary of the week column, the weeks now go from week one to week 65. It's numeric. It has a minimum. It has a maximum. It has a median. It's numeric data. It extracted what was numeric, converted it to numeric, and got rid of all those WKs in there that weren't doing anything. Okay. The funny thing is, we could do this in pivot longer also. So why week and not WK? Uh, because the name of the column is week. Um, that was it. The name of the column is week instead of WK. It's the one I created earlier. I created the names to week. And the question, why is it week 65 to 76 present? It's not just that most were NAs. It was that literally all of them were NAs. No songs charted over 65 weeks on it. So literally columns 66 through 76 were completely useless. In the wide format, they didn't even convey any information. And that's why reader assigned them a logical way back at the start. But that was hard to know without browsing down the entire column. Took care of it immediately in our pivoting. Okay, now we got a numeric week. We're going toward being able to do something with it. Another thing we could do, instead of doing that manually with parse number, pivot longer could also do it for us. I could add to my prior pivot longer syntax names prefix equals WK. So it's going to look for every value in the week column I create, look for ones that begin with WK and delete all the WKs it sees at the start of them, and then transform it to an integer value. This is an ugly syntax, but it's the way pivot does it. Um, this basically says, okay, 
delete all the WK prefixes on the values of weak, and then if possible, convert weak to, weak to an integer variable. I say that, the resulting data is, Tupac, baby don't cry, weak is now an integer vector, one, two, three, so on, no WKs here converted to numeric. This is equivalent to what we did on the previous slide with mutate, but if you really want to do it all in pivot, you can do everything all in pivot. It's quite like sophisticated. Okay, next. The track length column we got is not analytically friendly. So if you look back here on track length, four colon 22 is human digestible. It's four minutes and 22 seconds, but to R it's character data because it has a colon in it. It's not numeric data. If we wanted to do some sort of analysis of the length of songs, we would have to make this numeric in some way. We can do this with a little bit of uh, dplyr data manipulation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, let's take that Billboard 2000 data, and then let's separate the time column into two new columns. We're going to separate it into a minutes column and a seconds column. We tell it, in this time column, separate things by a colon. Anything in front of the colon goes into a new column called minutes. Everything after the colon goes into a new column called seconds. And then convert equals true says, if the resulting columns, minutes and seconds contain only numeric values, convert them into numeric data. They do. The resulting thing is a minutes and seconds column, which are numeric. If I want a length of songs in minutes, I can calculate it. I can say, Let's mutate a new length of the song variable, which is equal to the number of minutes in the song plus the number of seconds divided by 60. This will give us a length of a song in decimal minutes. That makes sense, right? The thing is, I only care about this length column, not the minutes and seconds columns I created from separate. So I immediately drop the minutes and seconds and keep only the length column. If I look at it, I can see now numerically the length of the songs in the data set. The shortest song on the Billboard Hot 100 of year 2000 was 2.6 minutes long. The longest song was free birding out here at 7.833 minutes of length. Okay? Something useful, numeric data, we could do something like look at the trajectories of songs over time in the Billboard Hot 100 by the length of the song. Maybe we think shorter, snappier songs stay on the Billboard longer because people don't get tired of them. Who knows? Okay, so this is an operation you might want to do. You can do it if you want. Okay, so that's pivot longer. Let's talk for a second about pivot wider. I don't do a ton of pivot pivot wider except when I'm prepping data for like structural equations, um, but maybe it's something you want to use. So pivot wider is the opposite of pivot longer. You use pivot wider when you have data for some observation taking up multiple rows and you instead you want it to be in a single row. Here's an example of something like that. Maybe what I have is data like this. I have a variable for group. This is group A, 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 different statistics. The mean, the median, and the standard deviation of a value for group A, and then the value of that mean, median, and standard deviation. This might look fine, but it's kind of weird because a 1.28 here and a 1.0 here are not really equivalent. And the 0.72 is definitely in different units than these other things. A mean, median, and SD should probably not all be in the same column. This is something that is too long and should probably instead be group A and then a column for mean, a column for median, and a column for SD, unless you're planning to do some kind of weird plot. Okay, This is something we want to pivot wider. Okay. This is just me creating the data to show you it's exactly the same as the last slide. If I want to pivot this wider, what I would do is say, I got some data that's too long. I want to pivot it wider. I'm going to get the names from the statistic column and the values from the value column. The result is going to be columns equal to a number of columns equal to the number of unique values of the statistic. And then the values will get populated in the cells. Because this old statistic column had the values mean, median, and SD, those are the new columns. And then these are the group specific values for each of those. So the prior thing here has been pivoted out so that each value mean, median, SD becomes a new column. This is pivoting data wider. 
Typically data you get will be too wide rather than too long, but it's good to know how to move back and forth between them. Okay, so let's do something with this. Let's look at all the songs that hit number one at some point on the Billboard Hot 100 and look how they got there versus the songs that didn't. So what I'm gonna do is say, take the Billboard Hot 2000 day or Hot 100 data, group it by the artist and the track. Within artist and track, mutate and give me the number of weeks the song was at number one is equal to the sum of rank equals equals one. Why does that work? Rank equals equals one returns what? What do you get when you do something like this? All the weeks where the rank was one. But specifically, rank equals equals one is gonna return a data type. What is it gonna look like? Just the rank equals equals one. True and false. Yeah, exactly. It's gonna be trues and falses. The thing is, is trues of a number one, falses of a number zero. If you get the sum of rank equals equals one, that is a count of the number of weeks the song was at number one on the billboard. This is a, using logical expressions like this, like their numeric, to get some useful summary out of it. Okay, so this is gonna be a count of the number of weeks it was at number one. Then I say the peak rank is, if else, any one of the ranks, any week the song was at rank number one, then it was a song that hit number one, if no rows of the data for a given artist and track have rank equals equals one, then it never hit number one. Then I ungroup my data because I don't want to group later. And now I have a couple new variables in my data set. Let's use them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a big ggplot. I'm not going to go over the code for this ggplot for the interest of time. There's nothing novel in here except for I've put a logarithmic x-axis to make it so um, the space between space between weeks is wider at the beginning and the end because there's more data at the beginning. And I reverse the y-axis because you want rank number one at the top instead of at the bottom because the best rank is number one, not 100. Nothing else is particularly novel here. This is the plot we get. This is the trajectory of every song that charted on the Hot 100 in the year 2000. The red lines are songs that ever hit number one. The black lines are songs that never hit number one. And this is the arc every song takes going through the data. Okay, So you'll see, typically, songs sort of have a, an arc up through the data where they kind of go steadily upward from the beginning, though every once in a while you get something that kind of like looks like it's tapering off and then shot up suddenly. And then things tend to die off pretty quickly at the end, except for certain ones that seem to go up and down. A critical thing we see in this that reveals the importance of plotting your data is there's something weird about these data, okay? I did not delete observations down here or cover this with a legend or something. For some reason in the Billboard Hot 100 data, they just truncate the songs that don't go, don't stay above rank about 50 in the data past week 20. They're just deleted from the data set. You can guarantee a lot of these songs kept tracking on the billboard, but they just didn't include them in the data set. Why? I don't know. But if you didn't plot your data, you might never have seen this. So remember, when you're working with data sets, plot stuff all the time. You, things will jump out to you. You never would have noticed looking at them in tabular form or summary form. Okay. So this is the trajectory here. But again, remember, Week 10 here is a different week of the calendar year for every one of these songs. We might want a different type of uh, plot, maybe that looks over calendar time. Okay, we'll get there in a minute. Next question, which songs were number one the most weeks of the year? I can say, give me the Billboard 2000 and then the distinct artist track and number of weeks it was at number one, and then just arrange them by the number of weeks they were at number one. Look at the first seven songs, P. Rudy to Keith Enrique on there, and we see that the song at number one for the longest period of time was Destiny's Child with 11 weeks at number one here, and then down to Enrique at the bottom here with three weeks at number one. Some nice, useful information uh, for us if we really care about the songs that we're charting in my sophomore year, high school, something like that. Something like that. Anyway, <clears throat> I'm old. 
that's what we got um, for that. Now I'm going to move on and quickly brush through dates and times and see if we can squeeze in factors before the end. I guess I shouldn't have taken that break earlier. I should have known better. So anyway, let's do some stuff with Lubridate. Oh yeah, sorry if it uh, froze up a little bit there. I shouldn't be having any connection problems, but do scream at me if that happens. Okay, so next, let's get some usable dates. Like I said before, we have the date the song first charted, but the actual numeric weeks are not calendar weeks. They're a weird like week counting after the week that it entered. But we can easily convert that information to calendar weeks, right? So what we're gonna do are say, let's take the Billboard 2000 data and then I'm going to mutate a new date column. This is going to be equal to the date the song entered the Billboard Hot 100 plus week minus one times seven. So what I'm doing here, it turns out date objects in R, like our date column, our original date entered column, date objects in R use a numeric unit of days. If you add one to a date in R, it increments the date one day and it obeys all the rules of calendar time, like paying attention to leap days and calendar months and all of that. So if I say the current week that the song is ranked in is the date it entered plus week minus one. This means that week minus one in the first week, we just want it to be date entered. But in the next week, we want it to be seven days later, so on and so forth. So for this first Tupac song here, in week number one, the date of the rank was the date it entered the Billboard Hot 100. But the next week is seven days later. Seven days after February 26 is March 4th. It was at rank 82. Seven days later, it's March 11th. Seven days later, it's March 18th. So. You can use numeric addition and subtraction with dates, and it respects calendars perfectly fine and takes care of it all for you. Okay. So I do a quick plot over calendar time. This is the same basic plot as before. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on it. Basically, you get a big rat's nest if you plot over calendar time. The reason you get a plot that looks like this is this is the Billboard Hot 100 of a given week. No song can occupy multiple slots, and every slot must be occupied, so there must be an observation at every point on the, the thing. Ah, I'm being visited by an animal. Come on. Get over here, you little savage. Oh, come on. He visits you. Gaze upon the floof. Yeah, I know. Now you're upset you came in here, aren't you? Okay. Get down there, you sausage. Okay, there we go. So, um, she's a very sweet cat, but she's very loud, um, which I usually don't mind, but when I'm teaching, it can be complex. But if I let her be in her box, she probably won't scream at me. She's a very good conversationalist. Anyway, um, so we get this sort of like hare's nest here, but we see something also interesting in here we might not have captured without plotting the data. This data set is the Billboard Hot 100 of the year 2000. Well, all of these observations to the left here are not in the year 2000, and all these observations here are not in the year 2000. Turns out in the Billboard Hot 100, if you started tracking as a song before the beginning of the year 2000, they still have all your data from when you first started tracking. And similarly, if you tracked past the end of the year 2000, they keep it as it goes off. Something interesting? Yeah, but this is calendar time. Okay, keep chugging along in the interest of time. So do a quick little practice working with date and time information. I'm going to pull some data for some more granular time. Um, I primarily work with crime data. Um, so I'm going to pull down some crime data. This is Seattle Police Department 911 incident response data for a single day in Seattle. Um, it's got a bunch of stuff in it. The main thing I'm interested in here, like it has things like, um, well, we'll see here. It has things like the type of event it was, a car prowl theft, which is specifically a car prowl, the location it happened in, including longitudes and latitudes, which we're gonna use in week nine, um, stuff like that. But the thing I'm gonna work with for right now is it has uh, dates in it. Things like March 25th, 2016 at 11.58, 30 p.m. We can use these dates and times to work with minutes and seconds and 24 hour clock time. 
Okay. To do this, the package I recommend for working with it is Lubridate. This might change though. There is a new package coming out. I forget the name of it. Uh, that just popped out as a new Tidyverse package as an alternate for Lubridate, but Lubridate for now. Um, Lubridate is for working with dates and times. Um, so do I have an aside on, yes, I do. Okay, good. Um, so if I look at these data, structure, SPD raw, event clearance state, it's character data that looks like this, 03 slash 25 slash 2016 space 11 colon 58 colon 30 space PN. This is a string of character data that R doesn't at the moment know is in fact a date time object. Okay, we want it to be in a date time object, specifically POSIX CT, which I'm gonna talk about in a second. To do this, I'm gonna use Lubridate because it's way easier to use Lubridate to do this than any other alternative. So I load up the Lubridate package. If you've installed the Tidyverse, you've got Lubridate, but you will have to load it. I'm gonna create an object called SPD, assign to it SPD raw, my raw data, and then mutate, overwrite my event clearance state with MDYHMS, event clearance state, time zone, America, Los Angeles. So Lubridate has a ton of these functions. This says, I'm going to give you data event clearance state whose format is in order month, day, year, some delimiter, hour, minute, seconds, and I'm going to allow Lubridate to figure out what separates the months, the days, the years, the hours, the minutes, and the seconds from each other. This is a very smart function. It will crack open this text that looks like this and figure out, okay, this is months. It's separated from the days by a slash. It's separated from the years by this. The time is over here separated by a space. It looks at this whole thing and says, Okay, that's 11, but it's ambiguous because there's two 11s in clock time, but I see a PM, so it's 11 PM. Let's convert this to 23 hours, 58 minutes and 30 seconds. This here is POSIX time. POSIX time is in an adult date format like other countries use where the slowest changing thing comes first, the year, then the month, then the day, then the hour, then the minute, then the second not the in no conceivable way logical date format of the United States, which has month, the middle speed changing thing, then the fastest changing thing, then the slowest changing thing. Who came up with this date format? I know like when you're speaking it, it kind of sometimes makes sense of the order of utility of information, but no, there's no way this makes sense. So this is more like an ISO standard date down here. POSIX time, the way R stores it, or more specifically, the way Unix operating systems store data, looks like this. Lubridate converts it to this, and you'll notice it immediately says the data type is this POSIX CT data. Okay, so a quick aside on time. Times are weird, okay? So there's two different ways R can store date and time information. They are POSIX CT and they are POSIX LT. POSIX CT is a numeric vector containing a count of the seconds since the beginning of 1970. That is how Unix operating systems store date and time information. If it's a date before 1970, it is a negative number. That's how they do it. This is actually where the year 2000 bug problem came from because they would have done a buffer overflow of 16-bit numbers in the year 2000, actually the year 20. No, it's a 2032 problem for Unix. They have to update to a larger from 16 to 32 bit to store enough seconds after uh, 1970. So if your operating system is still a 1980s era Unix system, it will die in 20, I think it's 2032. I'm not positive though. Anyway, you don't need to know about that. There's also POSIX LT, which is a named list of vectors where each one contains lots of date time information. You rarely see POSIX LT. We usually use POSIX CT, okay? Lubridate gives us convenience functions for working with POSIX objects like this and converting them into other date time objects. If you're working in a statistical model or plots, it's often easier to convert time to a standard numeric value using as.numeric and work with it that way. But if you need to plot things over actual calendar time and stuff, you probably want to keep it in a date time object and work with things like special functions for using axes and dates and times. 
So useful date time functions. So if we've got a few observations of event clearance date, here I just have 2016-03-25. So if I grab some date time information, but what I care about is not the time, just the date, you can convert date time information to just a date using the function as.date. I say as.date, some date time info, maybe give it a time zone to be specific, and it will give me the current date from that date time object. You can then do stuff with it. If you have a date or a date time, in LuberDate, you can say, I want to know what day of the week it was. If I say weekdays of a date time object, it will tell me these observations that in 2016, March 25th was a Friday. Okay, You can extract the weekdays. You can also do some math with them like this. I could take a date time object and say, add a duration of one hour to it. You can't do direct addition to it because the units would be in seconds. But if I want to add one hour to it, this now would properly increment from, if you remember, it was 11.58 PM on March 25th. If I add one hour to it, it properly increments to March 26th at 12.58 AM. So it knows how to do increments over clock time and calendar time appropriately. If you're going to do any kind of math with dates or times, convert them into a date time object and do it all to that. You do not want to find yourself trying to manually add days to a numeric date time value and get proper calendar times typically, because you have to deal with things like leap years, calendars every month having a different number of days and so on. Okay. So using this, we might ask questions like, what time of day were most incidents in our SPD data cleared? I can do this like, let's get an SPD times data frame, which is going to be my SPD data, and then select only I care about initial type of group, the type of crime, and the event clearance date, the date time it was cleared by the police, mutate the hour of day is equal to the hour of the event clearance date. This will extract a numeric hour. It will remove the date portion of it and the rest of the time and just give me an integer hour of the day where zero is midnight and 23 is 11 p.m. Okay. I then do a quick plot of this. This is me just saying, take that SPD times data set, make a histogram of it over the hours of the day. I facet it by the type of crime in the data set. We get something that looks like this. There's a lot of different event type groups in the data set. There are things like assaults, general disturbances, parking violations, suspicious circumstances, traffic calls, trespassing, robberies, you name it. Okay, it's a lot of different things here. So if I was going to show this plot to people, I would probably not want my data organized this way. I might instead want some of these less common, rare things to be shown last and the more common things the SPD responds to to be shown earlier on. So things like traffic calls, suspicious circumstances up at the top, and rare stuff like parks exclusions shown down in the bottom right. To do that, to reorganize the facets, we've got to play with some factors. So last thing I'm going to talk about in the last five, seven minutes here is how do we manage factor variables to reorder our plots and our models? So, okay. Factors, as I've said before, are a common but kind of fussy data type in R. If we want to do things like reorder legends and things in our plots, we need to know how to work with factors. They're kind of a pain. So the order of factor levels, right, controls the order of your categories in your tables in R, in your axes, in legends, and facets in ggplot. It also controls reference categories in regression models and the sort of order you see them in a regression table. So basically the idea is maybe we want to order things not alphabetically, that is putting Alabama first on every single plot of the states in the United States, but rather order them by some other value uh, variable or by some aesthetic order. Okay, to do that we got to modify our factor levels. So. The four cats package is a tidyverse package for working with categorical data. It's four categoricals. 
This four cats package does a lot of the same stuff as the base R factor functions, but it also adds some additional ones and has better syntax overall. If you want to know a lot about four cats, it's got a manual and vignettes you can look at. I'm only going to cover a few things today. I mostly just want to direct you to this package for working with factors. Okay, so load up the four cats library. Let's say I look at this initial type group uh, column in my SPD times data set. It looks like this. It's character data. It has values like theft, theft, trespass, crisis call, stuff like that. If I want to convert it to a factor variable, I can say, take my SPD times data and then mutate initial type group to be a factor of initial type group. This just converts it to a factor. If I get head on SPD initial type group, the data are now a factor. And instead of being quoted, it shows their labels like theft, theft, trespass, crisis call, and also says there are 30 different levels. That is, there are 30 unique values of initial type group, and their levels are things like animal complaints, assaults, auto recoveries, all the way to weapon calls at the end. Okay. If I say convert SPD times initial type group to numeric, you'll see its values are actually things like 25, 25, which corresponds to theft is level 25, level 28 is trespassing, level six is crisis call, level 24 is suspicious circumstances, and so on. Okay, factors have an underlying numeric level. Okay, what we want to do though is we want to make it so that these levels are in different numeric order because these numeric levels control how they show on a ggplot. In other words, level six right here, which is uh, what? Crisis call would be the sixth thing on a ggplot legend or the sixth, sixth facet shown on a plot. For instance, if I go back to this, one, two, three, four, five, six, crisis call. It's the sixth facet because it's the sixth level in the data, okay? That's how it works. It just maps them on on the level of the uh, factor onto our facets, but that's not what we want. We want to shake up these things, okay? So maybe what we want to do is we just want to re-level our factor by the frequency it appears in the data. There's a convenience function in forecasts to do this. If I say, take my SPT times data and then mutate initial type group equals FCT in frequency of initial type group. What this is going to do is reorder the factor levels. So the new factor level one of initial type group is the thing that is observed most in the data set. What initial type group is the most common? Turns out it's suspicious circumstances. The second most common is traffic related calls. The third is theft. The fourth is disturbances. So what it did is it reordered our factor level. So factor level one is the most frequent factor level in the data. So instead of being in alphabetical order like they were before, it's an order of frequency. If I then just do the exact same plot I did before, this is the same code as before, the only difference is that I've reordered initial type group by the frequency of the factor level. My facet, my plots, will now be the most common SPD incident. First, the least common last. There was only one person down injury observation in the data. So if you want to know how to reorder your plots based on uh, anything in your data, you have to reorder your factor levels. You can use functions in four cats to do that. Now our facets are ordered by whatever was most common, for instance, suspicious circumstances. And you can kind of tell because it's just more gray area in these higher ones than in the bottom ones. <clears throat> okay, that's a convenience function. Okay, there's other ways to reorder though. Maybe you want to reorder them based on something other than their frequency. Maybe you want to reorder them by like what has the highest numeric value of something or lowest numeric value. There's a generic function for that called FCT reorder. This you give it some factor or character data which you want to turn into a factor 
some quantity you want to order it by, and some function to apply to the quantity to determine what is the highest level value, like the minimum, median, mean, maximum. Okay. So this is useful for things like making your legends go from the highest to lowest value visually using the maximums or making your axis labels go from lowest to highest using like a mean of a variable. I got one example of this I'm going to show you. So, uh, oh yeah, another thing you can do, maybe you just want to change the reference level. You don't actually care about anything except the first level. This is good for making a new reference in a regression model. FCT re-level and ref equals will change that category to be level one and leave everything else the same. That will then be the reference level in your regression model or the first level in your plot. Okay, here's an example. I'm going to pull out just the Jay-Z data in the Billboard 2000. I say, take the Billboard 2000 data and then filter so the artist is Jay-Z and then mutate track is just the factor value of track. I'm going to make a quick plot, which is Jay-Z data with a bad legend. Okay? This is just a simple plot of the week it was on Billboard Hot 100, the rank of the song. That's it, a line plot. It's going to look like this. Okay, so what we see here is the trajectory of these Jay-Z songs over the week they were on the Billboard Hot 100. The thing is, is this order that the lines show on in the plot, the purple one first here, is not in the same order as the legend. You'll see the first legend is the song Anything, which is in the middle of the data. Big Pimpin' is up here. It's the second one, which happens to line up coincidentally here, but Do It Again here is green, not the same order that they are in in the track legend. Maybe what I want is to make it so that the order of the legend matches the order they are in the data plot. Okay, so I need to reorder these things based on the actual values of the data. To do that, I could say take my Jay Z data and then mutate so track is equal to factor reorder the track variable by the rank column, specifically by its minimum value because minimum is better values. So one would be the best, 100 would be the worst. I then make a good legend plot, which is exactly the same plot as before. The only difference is I have reordered the track factor by the rank of the song. My new plot looks like this. It's the same data, but now the legend here has the top ranking song top, the bottom ranking song bottom. So it's approximately in the order of the lines on it. This makes my plot look a little bit better. Theoretically, an even better way to do this would be to not have a legend at all and just have the name of the song attached to the line somewhere. But I'm not going to cover that because you don't do that with factors. Okay. One last thing to say. Sometimes after subsetting your data, you're going to end up with extra factor levels in your data you don't want. So for instance, I could say, take my Jay-Z data and then filter track to only be the songs I Just Want to Love You and Big Pimpin'. Even though those are the only two songs in my data now, if I get the levels of the track factor, the levels of the songs I removed are still there. Okay? The reason for this is factors do not get their levels from seeing the data. The levels are their own metadata stored in the factor. Even you can have no observations of a factor level, but still have it there. This is sometimes useful for variables if you have like no missing data, but you want to have available missing data levels. You might not actually have them in the data. If you want to remove these because you don't want them to show up in a regression model or something in a weird way, you can say, take my data frame and then drop levels. This will drop extra factor levels for every column in the data set. You don't do this in a mutate, you just apply it to the whole data set. Now, if I get levels, Jay-Z's biggest track, it doesn't have the extraneous levels. Okay, sorry for going for three minutes over. Last thing I wanna talk about is your new harrowing homework. So we've worked mostly with relatively easy data and easy things, and that changes today. What I'm giving you is an administrative data set. Your homework is to work with vote tallies from the King County 2016 general election. This is a 60 megabit, I believe, comma delimited text file date from King County. You can get them off the course website. Use the one on the course website, not the one from King County. These data have no documentation other than what is provided in my template. 
So you're gonna to need to do a little bit of detective work and mess with them and clean them up in R. Um, yeah, so download the RMD template, use the RMD template. This homework is split into two halves. You will do the first half over the next week, the next half the next week. This is a long homework. I recommend at least getting started on it before Monday to get a feel for it. Read instructions closely. If you can or want to work with other people, talk to the people, use the mailing list in Slack. If you get stuck on stuff, don't bash your face against it. Ask for help or stop. We will do the entire first half of this in lab on Monday. So if you find it really frustrating, we're gonna do it. But I do recommend looking at it. This is a long one. Do not expect to be able to like power through it in one sitting. If you don't have the time for it, come to lab on Monday and we're gonna work through it, okay? But it's a tough one. So we'll see you folks on Monday in lab um, and we will work our way through it. And then next week we'll work our way through the rest of it. Okay, if you got any questions, I'm right here. Otherwise, sorry for running long and I'll see you folks on Monday. Thank you. Yeah, it's worth it to see the cat.